Hello friends and fellow archivists. I uh, recently embarked on a fairly lengthy tape restoration project and uh, since there were so many parts to the work I thought it may be fitting for me to give a little introduction and a, and a little overview of of uh, what it was all about. Um, several hours of video uh, details the work that I did uh, to save a uh, quad tape for a, a uh, customer. And uh, this tape is uh, part of a, uh, I guess, a series or a collection that uh, aired over a network in the 1970s through the 1980s. And so it's kind of important, you know, if they uh, recover as much as possible. And uh, so our old friend, the the flange glue struck <laughs> again. Now this is a one hour reel. And a couple of places were very uh, severely damaged, you know, and and getting the tape separated uh, caused another, you know, uh, bit of damage, you know, just getting it apart. And uh, so what I wound up with was two sections about six feet in length each. And that's what these little these little Q marks are here. Uh, that's telling me the beginning of each damaged section. Uh, you'll see more about that later on in the in the uh, upcoming videos. And uh, so basically uh, uh, what I set out to do was to recover as much as possible and in this case, that entailed more of recovering the audio track than the video, which that's where a lot of the damage had occurred, is, is down in the tape. And uh, so, you know, if you have if you have the audio or can recover the audio in its entirety or, you know, maybe 90% or more, you know, that's a workable uh, situation because if you have that, you can look at other parts of the tape and you might find a wide camera shot or you might find a shot where there's no you know, nothing uh, going on, nobody talking. I guess you'd call that a, a B shot. And, uh, you know, you can take a shot from here or a shot from there and edit that in, you know, and uh, in, 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 in the stead of the damaged part, which you can't do much with and that will I guess in a sense preserve the entirety of the, the program uh, but it's a little hard to do that unless you can save all the audio track from the damage section so that was kind of my what it boiled down to and my 
chore to uh, try to save as much of or all of, if possible, the audio portion. And then that will allow the, uh, the uh, editing folks that get the file when I'm done with it to do their magic and do a little editing there and, and put a few camera shots with the uh, surviving audio. That's maybe the best case scenario uh, sometimes, you know, because if there's nothing there to preserve or save, then, you know, <laughs> you can't really make something out of nothing. You know, and at least if we have the audio, then you have some continuity there, you know, to work off of. So, uh, anyway, and getting there is half the fun, <laughs> as they say. And so, that was the, uh, the job, is to fix this tape. Uh, part two and part three of this series is fairly lengthy. I think they're about 30 minutes each, and it details the work that I did to reconstruct those damaged areas of the tape. Uh, part four and part five was... Uh, Part four was uh, testing and burnishing the repaired area. And uh, so that explains all about that. And uh, the uh, part five and six dealt with uh, doing some machine modifications in order to make this workable on the machine, you know, when, when the tape is repaired. And in this case, what that entails is, uh, you know, when you have fragments that you're splicing back together, and they're not clean breaks, you know, they're jagged fragments and you're trying to piece a jigsaw puzzle back together. That's a very fragile uh, um, thing. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to recover the audio because you just have one longitudinal track and it's going past the stationary head, you know, so there's not much uh, danger there of, of uh, you know, having, inflicting more damage or, you know. So, uh, in order to do that on the quad machine, uh, we need to not have the guide engage the tape against the spinning rotary head since we're not going to use that part of the video anyway and we're only interested in recovering the audio uh, okay I hear you say well why don't you put it on a 24 track or a 16 track machine well, I could do that if I had one. <laughs> uh, and another thing you could do is uh, you could remove the video head from the machine. And, you know, you can achieve it that way. And then you would wind up with an audio track of some length that you could edit back in to the other parts. Well, yes and no, that works 
to a point. Depends on what machine you're working with and and uh, other things like how much or how close do you want to get to the damaged section to recover. And of course, you want to try to get as much as you can, good, you know, and not worry about the bad part, the video section. Uh, and something comes in there when you're doing that, if you're removing the video head, uh, there may be a difference in the speed uh, of the capstan slightly. Of course, you can readjust all that digitally now, you know, with computer programs. Uh, stretch it out or scrunch it up, speed it up, slow it down, change the pitch, do whatever. Uh, but doing it the old-fashioned way with hardware, you know, you you could introduce a speed variation. Just the nature of the machine, you know, how it, the uh, capstan is controlled, well, by an inner sink or a sink system, you know, a phase locking. And so if you take that part away, then your audio may not be the same speed. Uh, so I really didn't want to do that. Uh, why create another problem when you don't have to? So it then becomes, well, to play that back at speed, you're going to have to disengage the tape from the head or from the spinning disc. And the way you do that is you turn the guide off, the guide solenoid to be exact, and that opens it up. That moves the tape away from the head. And by doing that, if you can switch that on and off, you know, randomly at will, then yeah, you can uh, you can run right up to the bad spot with good video and then cut it off. And then as soon as the, the last part of the splice goes through, cut it back on and then your machine will lock back up within about a second of time. So you, you recover you know, just about all the good usable video portion. And uh, that's what these little uh, these little Q-tapes are all about here, which you'll see later on in, the, in one of the later videos. So how do you achieve that? Well, in this case, uh, you know, I've got a a room full of machines here and every machine has got pros and cons, pluses and minuses, certain things that it does better than other things on other machines and so you have a mixture of capabilities with each and every machine and you know there is no be-all, end-all, do-all machine when you get into, you know, very defined or particular problems, you know, that where, where your options are limited. It's a matter of taking what you've got and then finding which machine is the most capable of doing what needs to be done. In this case, uh, my old fallback was the 1200C uh, Ampex, and uh, the C was the last iteration of the 1200 line that Ampex made, and there's a lot of resemblance to a 2000B when you're looking at a 1200C. Um, 
they uh, used a split 12 volt power supply on the C just as they did on the 2000B. One to uh, power the intersync servo and then the other one to power the uh, signal system. And uh, the C also uses the same uh, audio chassis as a 2000B did. Same thing. Uh, one interesting difference about the audio on the 1200C is that uh, instead of using a three row uh, audio stack, the, uh, the connector I'm talking about now, three rows of pins, they use the four row connector arrangement that the AVR2 used. And uh, I found that kind of interesting, you know, that an AVR2 head will work on a 1200C, but a 2000B will not, because it's a different connector. Now, it's basically the same head arrangement. You know, you had the erase, record play, and then you had the uh, the uh, monitor head, three head arrangement. And uh, so you get into little differences like that. And, and the difference here in choosing the 1200C or 2000B, but I've got my 2000B set up to do 405 right now, and I didn't want to go monkeying with that. So, you know, the C will, will, will do just about the same thing. And uh, it's the same head assembly, which is, is a Mark 10. And that's this thing. And so basically what I did is, uh, let our camera settle down here, is I wired an on-off switch in the uh, guide servo, or the guide solenoid circuit, excuse me. And uh, so this, I broke the ground lead from the guide, the guide solenoid, so this breaks the ground connection. And so when I open this switch, of course, the solenoid de-energizes and it opens the guide. And uh, of course, when I close it, the solenoid re-energizes and re-engages the tape uh, with the uh, video head. Uh, okay, I hear you say, well why don't you use this little mechanical uh, lever here? It does the same thing. Well, that's right, it does about the same thing, but you cannot get quite as much uh, opening by doing this as you can by completely uh, de-energizing the, the guide solenoid. So it was a matter of clearance and I wanted to get the most clearance that I could possibly get. You know, so instead of doing the mechanical trick, I opted to just solder in a switch. Um, well, okay, why didn't you use an AVR1? Well, in this application, they're wonderful machines and they'll do a lot of stuff. But, in order to make one do this, it was going to be a little bit more work involved. And here's why. This is a head from an AVR1. And it's, there's nothing manual about it. It's a totally automatically controlled, machine controlled head. And you notice 
here's you got your drum and down here is your tape guide and you've got a little motor down in the head base that engages right here this little shaft and its job is when a tape floated is to run that guide up and down uh, so that's not really the handiest thing you know to have to work with to do what I'm wanting to do uh, and once this guide is engaged you have another little lever right here and it works like a uh, a uh, I guess a push cam uh, and it engages with a little shaft that sticks in there and uh, let's see if I can get this in its place and uh, there we go as this is depressed further and further down that's what moves the guide closer or further away from the uh, the uh, drum um, so that's uh, that's not really very uh, uh, usable, you know, when in this situation because there's it's just a little too much mechanically involved, you know, to simply just disengage this kind of a guide arrangement. Uh, well, and there's, I guess, another thing would be uh, if you're looking at the tape path, you know, of an AVR1 versus a 1200 or a 2000, you've got uh, double backs, you know, 180 degree double back, where the tape is just double back over itself, 180 degrees, in the uh, vacuum column and coming out of the column and going in the column you've got a sharp angle there of about a hundred and thirty five or a hundred and forty degree bend uh, that you're subjecting the tape to all these bends and not only once but twice you know coming in and going out on the take up side so you're stressing all that uh, uh, those reparations and splices to you know a lot of uh, flexing and and uh, so you know that's that's not really an ideal situation either uh, to do that and uh, another I guess a point of interest to take into account is the uh, tape handling itself on a uh, well an AVR1 or an AVR3 those real motors are controlled by servo loops and uh, so you can have you know electronic shuttling and uh, that's kind of a dangerous combination when you have a, a tape that's extensively damaged. Uh, one little slip or something rips apart if a splice doesn't hold. Uh, you could, you know, one of the tape reels could uh, react to that and maybe 
jerk real hard, you know, and, and pull the rest of it apart. It's not a very forgiving transport in that sense. And the other thing that really I don't really like to do on damaged tapes and heavily repaired tapes is rewind them, you know, through the transport. It's most ideal when you get done with the section or sections or whatever it is you're doing stop the machine and unthread the tape completely from all the guides, the heads, everything and go directly from the take up reel straight across to the supply reel and rewind it from one reel straight to the other reel and not go through all that transport the heads and the guides and whatever um, so I really like doing that, and you can sort of do that on an AVR2. Uh, they're a little bit more electronic than a, 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 a 1200 or a 2000 in the sense that they have a, a, a TRIAC motor controller, which, you know, is does about the same thing as the old voltage divider resistors, only it can be proportional torque. So it's, I guess you could think of it as a step above just having a, a resistor divider for your torque. And uh, the transport on a 2 is basically the same as a 1200 or a 2000 other than that you know it's the same path the same uh, guides and uh, basically the same video head is a 15 instead of a 10 but in the outwardly appearance and it's outwardly operation it's you know identical to mark 10 inwardly it's different um, One problem you have when you're trying to do something like this on an AVR2, even though it's you know it was the same basic head design, is uh, the capstan servo. They've got a digital time base corrector and it gets its vertical reference or its framing reference off the tape so the capstan servo has got to be frame locked uh, and that means the machine has to be reading the vertical interval off the tape at all times if it doesn't you don't know where the frame starts and uh, you might see the vertical interval drop down in the active picture area if it if it loses that and uh, that's a little more tricky you know to fool the servos on an AVR2 because they're more sophisticated you know more digitally uh, controlled and so with more sophistication you know becomes more complicated when you're trying to you know <laughs> make things work uh, in a non-standard way the nice thing about a uh, 2000 or a 1200 is you got a you got a knob a big rotary selector switch right on the panel and you can select any or every servo mode you know at will and uh, cause that machine to operate just exactly how you want it to and in this case we want to be running in a horizontal mode instead of auto 
and by switching it to horizontal then you're not no longer looking for that vertical sink interval on the tape you know and uh, so that comes into play when you're switching this guide on and off you know to uh, uh, get around the damaged part and then still maintain the machine lock because uh, you know we're still reading control track pulses uh, as the tape goes through and that's a little head right here Let's see if I can get it around here open this up a little bit it's this little head right here right there that's the control track head so we're still receiving and processing the control track pulses even though this guide is no longer energized you know and the tape is not engaged against the, the, the rotary head and uh, so when uh, you're in horizontal mode or well let's see what do you have uh, well horizontal if you're doing color which this is color uh, if you go to uh, reset or normal mode that's for black and white so we couldn't really use that for this and then the other modes are vertical mode which is what we're trying to <laughs> not use so we don't want to use that and the other one would be auto mode which is where you lock it vertically and horizontally and again it's like the AVR2 when you're in auto is it's going to be looking for the vertical interval on the tape and uh, since we're not mixing with other sources in this instance we're just going to be capturing to a computer then we don't care about whether it sees the vertical interval or not the computer capture will, will see it you see and uh, so, yeah, through a little bit of trickery and a little bit of uh, machine modification, I was able to, to make this thing happen and, and save a, an important tape for some folks. And I'm really glad about that, to be able to, to do that. And, you know, uh, I do a lot of glue tapes. For some reason, those tapes seem to find me. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, I do quite a few. Uh, and other types of damage, water damage and uh, stuff like that. But, uh, you know, one thing I would mention here that's if there's an archivist out there that's maybe doing this or maybe going to do it or going to try to do it or you know I don't know why you would want to try to do it <laughs> but uh, something to keep in mind that I've found and I talk a little more about this, I think, in part uh, part six of this series, uh, to do with the video head itself. And when I mean head, I'm talking about the tips on the drum, the four tips. Um, I've found over the years that more times than not it's a lot better to do this work with an alpha seal tipped drum rather than a ferrite tipped drum and the reason
reason being is, you know, you you hope you can get all the glue off, you know, but sometimes there's always, you know, a little residue or there's something that you cannot get off. And if you go a little too far, you'll be scratching off the oxide, and if you do that, then what's the point? You know, you've destroyed, you know, part of your recording. Uh, so, you know, there, there always seems to be, at least in my case, is there's always a little bit of residue that refuses to come off or maybe pushing things a little too far to try to make it come off, you know, if it's really dried in there and, and you soaked it to death and you can't, you know, you, you, you can do it, get it only so good and then, well, and there's ways that, you know, that I deal with that in, in cleaning and uh, there's some other videos out here that I've put out that go into that into some detail as to how I actually do the cleaning. And, uh, but uh, Alpha Seal is a metal, um, a metal alloy, I should say. And, uh, it is a uh, cast metal alloy. In other words, it's mixed together and melted in a big melting pot in the right proportions and, you know, all that. And then it is actually poured out, cast, into an ingot, you know, a block of metal. And that's alpha seal. And, of course, the tips for the video heads are cut, actually cut little pieces off of this big block, you know, and they're, they're lapped down and machined down to the right size and polished and everything. And then they're glass bonded to make a, you know, the gap and all that. but. But in the end, you know, an alpha seal head is a metal head. And it will take a lot more punishment than a uh, ferrite tipped head. And, well, to get into that a little bit, ferrite, uh, uh, you've got two two kinds. Uh, there was a single crystal ferrite that was used for a while. I don't think anybody used it that much for two inch video heads because there was a, a, a problem called rubbing noise that you would have with single crystal ferrite. And I'm not talking about a noise you can hear. It's noise that's generated by the force of the video head against the tape as it passes. And it's like, uh, you could think of that like a phonograph, an old phonograph cartridge where the needle is in the groove and the needle vibrates and causes the uh, this piezo element, which is a crystal, to contort. And when it does, it produces minute voltages, EMFs. Well, since a single crystal ferrite is basically a piezo crystal, then the same thing happens in effect as when that tip is going across the video tape surface is uh, just the compression of that tip, you know, the force against it.
causes a little bit of an EMF or a minute voltage and that's known as a rubbing noise but uh, to get back on track <laughs> uh, you have single crystalline and then you have polycrystalline ferrite polycrystalline is I guess the most prevalent or the most widely used in the two inch uh, variety and that's where you have uh, powders manganese zinc powders and uh, that's all mixed up and it's uh, compressed in a process called hot isostatic pressing hot pressing and uh, it's a just what it sounds like it's a press under a lot of heat and tons of pressure and isostatic means pressure from all angles you know equal pressure from all sides as opposed to a press where you would have like a cylinder you know and a piston where you're pressing from one end and so isostatic pressing is you know under pressure from all sides uh, high pressure actually and what that does is it compresses the open spaces between the molecules and so it just presses all the molecules together and presses out as much as those of those spaces you know and makes it a very dense material and that's good you know because it will conduct a lot more magnetic flux you know the, the higher the density and the way you get that is is you compress it under great heat and great pressure and uh, well in doing that with all these little bitty micro size granules of the manganese and zinc uh, so you actually it's made up you know you have a block of it but it's made up of all these little micro sized granules and so basically it's not uh, one piece as you would think of something that's been cast in a mold as being one piece. It's one piece made up of millions of very tiny little granule pieces. And what that tends to do when it strikes something is uh, you can fracture it, make little micro cracks in it and if you get one of those big enough then you'll have what's called a pull out and that's where a, like a brick in a wall you pull one brick out of a wall and a whole more bricks fall into the hole uh, so if you have a pull out where you have a little chink that's been knocked off of it then you have a danger of having a an avalanche a pull out you know and, and where a whole bunch of them will just let loose and then you'll have a a little jagged edge there and of course if you get enough of those on your tip or your tips on the drum <laughs> you're no longer going to have a good head uh, well if you get one in the gap you know it'll you'll have a bad head pretty quick uh, so yeah if, uh, if you endeavor to do any of this work uh, it would be to your advantage to do it with a video head that has alpha seal metal tips on it rather than a ferrite manganese zinc it. Uh, the alpha seal will stand up to a 
a lot more abuse and punishment, you know, when it comes to irregularities on the surface of the tape. They won't, it won't phase it, you know, whereas the ferrite, you know, you may do some damage to your tips, you know, depending on the condition of the tape. And of course, with a tape like this one that I just got done with, you know, where you have all these jagged edges in there sticking up, you know, that's just inviting uh, a, a problem to occur. And uh, so, well, that's just another little, little bit of information to go along with, with all this. And, uh, so I hope you like the series and maybe you learn something from it and uh, uh, I hope you never have to do it because <laughs> it's really, it's not as much fun as it looks like, <laughs> but that's what I do, so you know.